Good morning, DC Church. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It is good to see you. Let's stand together. We want to put our eyes on Jesus as we start a new year, putting our trust in Christ alone as our vision and our guide. Let's declare this together. In Christ alone.
you may be seated.
I want to hear voices of angels above sing as one.
Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, we come before you today humbly, looking forward to a new year with you in control. We thank you for your blessings and for your hand guiding and watching over us through this past year. We thank you for the hope that a new year brings. We thank you for the promise of this season as we reflect on new beginnings and new things, and new births. And yet we recognize that there are many among us who are going through times of sorrow and heartache and tragedy. We pray that you would be with those who are suffering, those who are ill, those who have lost loved ones, those who are questioning all that is going on around them. We ask that you would be a light and a hope and a strength and a source that is beyond our understanding. We thank you for the salvation that you bring through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who not only was born as a babe in a manger, but walked among us to demonstrate your love for us and to show us your compassion and your caring, demonstrating how we should live and how we should reach out to those who are hurting and those who are struggling with the love that you embrace us with. Father, we pray that you would help us this year to seek to be more like Christ, to follow his example, to yield our lives to him, to follow him faithfully, joyfully, completely. We ask that you would be with us and draw us ever closer to you. Help us to give you praise and glory that you alone are worthy of. And we pray that you would be with us as we encourage one another, as we seek to be faithful to the commission that you've given to us to go and make disciples of all nations. Speak to our hearts this morning. Embrace us with your love. Draw us ever closer to you. Teach us how we should walk and how we should live and how we should be more like Christ. Bless us through the word that you give to Pastor Ernie. Be with him, especially during this time. And help him to have strength that he needs to share with us your truth and your word. That we might grow in your grace and be faithful in serving you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to share our suffering. So in our sorrow we could see. Good to see everyone. I'm glad that you're here. Glad you are starting out 2021. Wasn't 2020 a great year? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, that was not the worst year in the history of the world, okay? I know folks think that. It wasn't even the top 100 in the last 2,000 years. But it seems that way to us because it was not the best time. Now I hope 2021 will be a better year, but don't expect it to get much better until about April or May, okay? And it should start improving. I want to remind you of the Lottie Moon offering for international missions. We take it Christmas time every year. You know, we give a Thanksgiving offering every year. We didn't do that this year. And I hope you'll take your Thanksgiving offering money that you would normally give at Thanksgiving and give it to the Lottie Moon offering. Our international missionaries, there's over 6,000 full-time ones, about 10,000 part-time ones. The entire budget of international missions comes out of this offering. So uh, when you give, every penny goes to make a difference. I hope that we can give $50,000. I hope we can. It'd be a great blow for evangelism that occurs. So please give your offering. I'm looking forward to seeing what it will be when it's all piled into a great pile. Now, you know, you know my mom passed away this week. And uh, I've been on an emotional roller coaster through the whole, whole deal. I, I talked to her on the phone two weeks ago and I went to see her often, but you know, because she was in a rehab facility and it was, it was supposed to be to get her on walking again. She had a terrible fall two years ago, but it just never quite worked out. And so it turned into a de facto nursing home. And so uh, I would see her through the window these last uh, m months since March. And then in November, we got a chance to go inside and see her behind a petition. So I haven't been able to hug her kiss her, put my hand on her shoulder and pray with her since March. And she's in a facility where they're supposed to protect her, right? That's where it's supposed to work. I talked to her two weeks ago on the phone. She was fine. We had a nice conversation. As always, she was wanting to go home. As always, she wanted to go to heaven, be with my dad. Uh, I didn't, had no idea at the time that uh, COVID would enter the nursing home and she would get the, get the virus and her... Uh, her uh, Progression in the virus was very quick. Last Sunday morning, I watched the first service at home. I saw Cal preach. I'm glad he got a chance to talk about having a blessed life. And I was getting ready to go to church when we got a phone call from my sister that she'd take a turn for the worse. And so my son, Josh, and I went up to Riverside Hospital and we got a chance to go into the COVID unit. I was double masked. And we saw her about 50 foot away through two doors and she waved at us. And, you know, they, they, the doctor recommended having her taken off the respirator because of uh, there was no hope that she could improve. But it's hard to do when, you, when she's waving at you. So we postponed for two days, but her heart just stopped. So the service will be on Thursday. It'll be a private one. 
Now, I'm not, I've, been, I've been up and down, but I'm not upset because my mother was a Christian. And one of the things that, one of the texts of Scripture that means a lot to me is from Philippians chapter 1. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion of the day of our Lord. And, and my mother, when she was a little girl from Kentucky, I don't know if she was a believer or not. She grew up across from a, a street from a Hard Shell Baptist church. And they preach real loud, Hard Shell Baptist. So I know she probably heard the gospel <laughs> on her front porch. Uh, but anyway, uh, I know though she became a Christian when she was 36 and she grew in her faith and served in the church for years. And so God began a good work in her. He carried it on through her life, through raising her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. And now it's been completed because she's with him in heaven, with my father again. And even that completion is not brought to a period yet because she'll rise from the grave someday. So we'll have that private service on Thursday, graveside service. And I, I would appreciate you pray for me and my family. And so although it's been up and down, I'm doing okay, okay? We're looking now at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, I'm hopping, skipping, and jumping through uh, some letters of Paul, but particularly through 1 and 2 Timothy. We're probably going to Titus, the pastoral epistles, because they were written to men who were pastors to help them in their work. And Timothy was very close to Paul. Timothy was his son in the ministry, his, um, his protege. And so Paul shared some deep things about how to be a pastor, but which can apply to all of us. Here we are in verse 22 of chapter 2. We're reading down to end of verse number 26. Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. I'll, I'll be talking to you about two things to avoid as we begin. First, avoid anger. Paul says to Timothy, flee the evil desires of youth. And, and you know, when you, when, you, when you hear that, you think youth, evil desires, he's talking about sexual passions and sexual temptation. But you have to do it in context. Paul spends the entire time talking about anger and quarreling and fighting. And so what he's doing is with Timothy, a young man is talking about his perhaps tendency to fight and quarrel and to be angry. Now, this is for everyone, for men and women, but it's particularly towards men. Remember, Timothy was a man. Timothy controlled by his passions. See, you men have a thing called testosterone. Did you know that? <laughs> testosterone is a good thing. God designed it. God gave it to us men. It helps us to be men. It, it, it encourages our masculinity. But there's a problem with testosterone in that you know, it, it leads to anger and to fighting. That was good when you're being chased by a grizzly bear back in the caveman days. They make you angry and they want to fight, but it's not so good <laughs> when you have to get along with other people. What's this between a pit bull and a man? A pickup truck with a gun rack in the back. <laughs> I was hoping for more out of that one. I really was. <laughs> Being a man, you see, we have, with testosterone, it's easy for us to be angry. And what Paul says is you have to run away from that. Run away from your anger. Run away from your tendency to fight and to quarrel and pursue. That is, run away from one thing and run towards something else. And the word pursue doesn't mean just run towards something. Pursue means you, you search it out. You find it. You have to track it down. So having the kind of life of maturity, see, he's fleeing the evil desires of youth, moving towards maturity. Pursuing maturity is something that doesn't come natural. You have to search it out. You have to find it. And the maturity that Paul describes here is one which is godliness, that is being like 
God. You want to be righteous, to be like Him. Have faith, faith that God will win the battle and it won't be won by your anger. You're pursuing love, loving people despite your differences, loving people despite how they might treat you. What you want to pursue is peace, not fighting, not quarreling, but peace. And you do this along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, what he's talking about is other brothers and sisters... You know, all us who are calling on the Lord out of a pure heart, we've been, we've been saved in Jesus Christ. He's talking about the church. The best place to grow and mature in Christ Jesus is inside of God's church. As, as the psalm says, iron sharpens iron. When you're with other believers, as you relate to them, as you interface with them, it encourages your growth and your maturity. And so what Paul wants you to do is to run away from your anger, and to pursue being righteous and godly as God is. I'm going to tell you about the time that I decided not to be angry in church anymore. I was pastor, you know, about two years. This is like 1992, pastor here. And we were working on um, relocation. About half the church wanted to relocate, about half the church didn't want to relocate. And just let me stop for a moment. Let's talk about America. In America, we have two sides which are roughly equal in size. And there's two entirely different ways of viewing life in these two sides of the problem. And when you have two sides in a problem which have nothing in common, almost complete disagreement, it's a recipe for anger and quarreling. And in our nation, we have to be aware of that and to get along with each other despite the fact we have such fundamental disagreements. But our church had a fundamental disagreement. Some weren't relocated and some didn't. And so I put together a task force not long after I became pastor. And our task force was designed to help us through the steps of relocation because our church had really decided to do it six years before. We just couldn't get it together. And I, I, I chose a fallacious way of working out the problem with this committee, this task force. Fallacious meaning false. I chose people for the task force who disagree with each other, people who were for relocation and against relocation. That's a very stupid thing to do. Now, I know it, seems, it seem, might seem wrong, but you should pick people for your committees and task force who agree with you. So you won't fight all the time. You can get something done. What our, what our task force did was fight every meeting. Every time we got together, we spent two hours fighting. We would have a meeting one month, and the next month do the whole thing all over again. And we never made any progress, never got anywhere closer to having the problem solved. So finally, after two years, we had made progress. We got to the point of being ready to re recommend to the church the, the ways of relocation, how we're going to raise the money, the kinds of buildings we're going to build, things like that. And I came into a meeting, and two of the, two, the task force members, two of the committee members had gone out and behind our backs had undercut the entire work of all the committee. And we were back to square one again. Now, let me tell you how I am as far as anger is concerned. I don't get angry easily, at least not now. I did when I was 25, but not now. Not even, not even in 1992. What happens is it builds up in me. You know, if something happens that, that, that's irritating, and that's, that, I mean, I, I deal with it, but it's still there, and it builds up, and it builds up, it builds up. Someone said this morning, yeah, you know, what, what you're talking about, Ernie, is having a long fuse. I have a long fuse. But when I explode, I explode. And so these two guys came in and undercut all of our work for two years, and I lost it completely. I turned red in the face. I was yelling. I was slobbering. I was so angry. And one of the guys who undercut all the work, the same fellow I talked to you about that would turn his head to the wall when I preached, he pointed at me and said to the rest of the task force, look what we have as our pastor. And my anger had put back the work of the church this work of this task force for another year. And so I promised myself that day I wouldn't get angry in church anymore. And it's been 28 years now. Watch out, it's building up. <laughs> because I learned my lesson. I learned what Paul was teaching Timothy. 
to avoid anger, to run away from it, and instead to pursue the kind of righteous way of living and thinking that God has, a way that leads to love and peace. So avoid anger. Avoid silly and foolish fights and quarrels. Paul said, Timothy, listen, you seek not the fight, not the quarrel, because most of the fights and quarrels you, you'll get into are really foolish and silly. Now, before I go on, there, there is a time to fight. Now, I don't mean with guns, I don't mean with fists, but there's a time to stand up for what you know to be right. The time to draw the line in the sand. And I think that doctrine and theology and right and wrong are times to stand and, and, and fight for the things you believe in. But how do you tell between when it's right to fight and when it's stupid and silly to fight? You have to have something called discernment. Discernment is an ability and it may even be a spiritual gift where you're able to, to see the situation and see the circumstance and with wisdom and logic know exactly what to do. To quote the great theologian and philosopher Kenny Rogers, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Got to know when to walk away. You got to know when to run. And that's what we talk about when we talk about discernment, right? So you discern when it's right to stand up for what is right, but normally, most of the time, when you fight with other believers, what it ends up in is a silly quarrel that does not build the kingdom of God. You've got to run away from those things, avoid them. Now, I, I could talk about all kinds of ways to deal with this inside of God's church, but I want to talk about family for a moment. And it comes to mind this week because of the, of the passing of my mom. And I'm aware, for, as being a pastor, uh, that lots of families are divided, torn with anger and dissension. I've done lots of funerals. I was thinking the other day how many funerals I've done. And, and you know, I can't come up with an exact number, but it's somewhere over 800. And I've gone to many, many hundreds more because I try to, if I can, go to every funeral of every family member of our church. And so, you know, every year I might go to three or four months, work weeks of funerals because of all the deaths that occur. So I've seen a lot of it at gravesides and in funeral homes and even at the church, I've seen families divided. My family is divided and it goes back a long way. My, my mamma, my grandmother, was born in 1892, my dad's mom. 1892, 19th century, a long time ago. And she was married before she married my pop and she had a, a daughter in that marriage who we always called Big Sister. When my dad was born, Big Sister was already in her 30s. Can you believe that? My dad came along pretty late in Mamaw's life. And what my, 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 uh, my Mamaw did was that Big Sister was her best friend. They did everything together. And so there was a strong favoritism to that first child and that part of the family. And meanwhile, the other three children were, were sometimes neglected and sometimes put aside. And, and there was resentment there because of that. And that resentment was growing long, long time before I was born. Well, my dad met my mom uh, when he worked at Woolworths as an elevator operator. Woolworths. Can you believe that? Five and dime store. And they got married. Uh, they, my mom was 19 when they got married. Now, I'll be honest with you. My mother was pregnant with me when they got married. And so my dad's family, Mamma and Pop and, and, and the, the siblings and especially Big Sister, hated my mom because she was a hillbilly from Kentucky. They looked down on her as being below their class. They thought she entrapped my dad, that the, the only reason my dad married my mom was because of me coming along. And so that was the, the environment I was in. As, as I was growing up, every Christmas on, on Christmas Eve, Mamma and Pop were the patriarch and matriarch of the family. And so the, all the family came together from all over the eastern part of Virginia. We went by yesterday after we went to the funeral home, we went by yesterday and we saw the house that my Mamma and Pop lived in when I was a kid. A little tiny house. 
that house was packed. Fifty people or so would come to that house on Christmas Eve. And I had a ball meeting all my relatives and talking to them, getting my presents, that sort of thing. But what I didn't know was, you know, I would go into a room, people talking, they all shut up. I didn't realize what was going on. They were fighting. And a lot of the fighting was about my mom. And I would go home after that on Christmas Eve, and my mom would go in a corner and cry because of how she was treated. Now, my pop would come over to the house. We, we didn't have much money. We were very, very poor at the time. And, and he would say, Archie, come here. And my, and my dad would go over to pop, and I, I could see him at the time. I didn't realize what was going on. I realize it now. He would hand like this a, a, a wad of money to my dad to help him out. Now, I would much rather be like pop than all those others who were filled with so much anger. And that anger is still displayed in my family. I have a brother and two sisters, and nobody gets along. What a shame. Because of something that happened in 1892 when my mamma was born. All that entered into our family. You know, I used to, to uh, <laughs> channel surf. I don't anymore now. I'm pretty much binging Netflix, watching the Golf Channel, and buying things on Easy Pay on Q QVC. That's what I'm doing these days. <laughs> but I used to hold a remote control in my hand. You know, back in caveman days, the cavemen would hold a rock and they'd do this. They couldn't. It was just built into them, you know. So I was channel surfing one day, uh, unusual for me to do it now, and I came upon a show called Dr. Pimple Popper. And I had no idea what the show was about. I thought it was a very intriguing name. So I'm watching, I started watching the show. And Dr. Pimple Park Popper, who's a very you know, attractive doctor, she goes into a room and there's a lady in there who has a very bad infection, she's had it for a long time. And I'm watching, you know, and Dr. Pimple Popper goes up to the lady and starts to massage her. And I'm not going to describe this. I'm not going to go any further than that, because if you evidently you probably know, although I had people come after the first service saying, I love Dr. Pimple Popper. What's wrong with us, friends? Come on. Anyway, she just starts to massage her, and oh, no, oh, 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 I will never watch this show again, and I never will. <laughs> Let me tell you what's happening. A lot of us have, building up inside of us, anger and hatred and animosity like a deep infection. You know, it's not good to watch Dr. Pimple Popper, but she's doing something important. I mean, she's helping somebody recover from a long-term infection. You need to get that out. You need to get it out. Because the quarreling and the fighting and the anger is stupid, stupid, stupid. I made a new word up. <laughs> It's what we call a portmanteau, if you know what that means. It's two words put together. It's stupid and it's foolish. It's not godly. It's not righteous. Avoid anger. Avoid foolish quarrels. Stupid disputes. Now, before I go on, let me say that I'm talking, hopefully, to people who are mature in Jesus... And, and you have an understanding of Scripture, understanding of what Scripture teaches. And you recognize as your, part of your maturity that, that if you live life, you will have enemies. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. And I want you to get this. You can't pray for your enemies unless you have enemies. He was the Son of God, and he had enemies. And if you live your life, you're going to have enemies, people who are against you. That's the way it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I hope, to people who are mature in Jesus or mature in Jesus. You have a good understanding of Scripture. And here's what your objective should be with those people who are provoking you to anger. What you want is to help them find the truth and to lead them into maturity and them into thinking and believing the right way. Your objective is not to win an argument. Hey, man, listen now, come on. Your objective is not to browbeat pe people in submission and to win an argument. What you want to do is lead people 
to believe the right things, to know the right things, to know the truth. You want to be an influence for the good. And you never get that by being angry. Let's read what Paul said here. Remember now, you, as a Lord's servant, you, you shouldn't be quarrelsome, but you must be kind to everyone, able to teach. Get that? Mature, understanding, not resentful. Now, here's where we come to it. So that, that what you want is not to win arguments, but instead that your opponents may be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance. They'll know the truth and come to the right understanding. Lead them into a knowledge of what the truth is, that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil. What he wants to do is entrap all of us. He's like a mighty lion going to and fro, seeking to devour us. He's taking them into captive to do his will. And what you want to do in your maturity is not to say, I'm more mature than you, I'm, more, I'm better than you. No, instead with love, help them to understand what's right to do. Now, this is what happens. Whenever I talk about what Jesus said about our enemies, pray for them, forgive them, turn the other cheek, or things like this, people come to me and say, Pastor, Ernie, listen, I, uh, I hear what you're saying, but I have a very hard time forgiving people. I have a very hard time with these things you're talking about. Now, when I say that, I want you to hear that I'm talking to myself too. I'm preaching to myself. You know, I had a, a time in my life for decades that I was an angry person. I had to come to deal, to, to terms with that, I had to deal with that. So I'm talking to myself. I'm not talking out of a place of, of, of superiority, a place where I've arrived and telling you how you should live. So I understand where you're coming from, but your problem is not with what I'm saying. Your problem is what, what Jesus taught, what Paul is teaching. So if you have a disagreement or you have difficulty doing something, it's not because of me or, or, or anything else said by anybody who's human. Your problem is with Jesus and what he taught. And if he taught to turn your other cheek and to forgive your enemies, you need to turn your other cheek and forgive your enemies. If Paul says, listen, avoid anger, flee it and pursue a better life. Watch out for quarrels are always stupid and foolish. Then you listen to this and your life will be so much happier. And your relationships will be so much more healthy. So this man... And, um, you know, uh, we make resolutions for New Year's, don't we? You ever done this? Just think it's, a, it's, it's your one-year anniversary of deciding to be a better person. How'd that work out for you, huh? <laughs> so this man comes to his wife and says, Honey, you know, New Year's coming on, and I've been reading all these articles about working out, avoiding fat and sugar in my diet, and I've come to a firm resolution for the New Year. I'm not going to read those articles anymore. <laughs> I was expecting more out of that one too. I don't. So the thing is, you don't have gain anything by avoiding what's true. So yes, our Lord's challenging us at a very fundamental and deep level to avoid anger. To Avoid quarrels and fighting. It's always stupid. And what you want is not to win arguments. What you want is to see the people that are in your family, in your circle of friends, restored to your friendship, restored to fellowship with you. You want to see them come into truth, if you can lead them the truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm praying that all of us here will listen to what Paul taught and we will recognize how dangerous anger is and how we have to avoid it. How foolish and non-productive quarrels are so we will avoid them. That our goal can be not winning arguments but instead making friends for the kingdom of God. Now, I pray for those people who are watching online now or maybe here in this worship center or at the West Portsmouth campus. 
who had not yet to believe in Jesus, I pray this will be the moment that they believe. I pray they'll pray this prayer with me. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. I've been angry in my life and fought with my friends and family in my life. I recognize now that all this is wrong, all of this sin. Will you forgive me because of what Jesus Christ has done for me on the cross? Will you come and live inside of me by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved? In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, you have become a Christian, part of the family of God. Let me know about your decision with the card that's in the chair in front of you. Or if you're watching online, tell one of our online counselors and we will stay in touch with you, share more with you about how to follow through in your faith. And Father, I'm praying for all of us now that we will avoid anger and pursue instead righteousness and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is my Father, we are praying that we can listen to Paul's teaching to his son in the ministry, Timothy, and learn by what he said that we will be people who, out of maturity, will avoid anger and foolish quarrels. Lord, I mentioned families today. Heal our families. Give us the, the ability to go to the family member that's angered us, who has hurt us. Maybe we were the one that was angry and hurt someone else, brother, sister, father, mother, son or daughter, and let out all that anger and bring those relationships to a healing. We pray this, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.